Um, we're going to do a little bit of an audible this morning as our beloved Rabbi David Saperstein tested positive for COVID yesterday. And Rabbi Saperstein uh, had written a keynote address to begin our panel today. Um, and luckily, Rabbi Dan Levin of Temple Bethel, Aboka, where are you, Dan? Uh, it's here, and he's going to be in a moment. Our Savior, thank you, Dan. Uh, is going to be delivering Rabbi Saperstein's remarks. And then through the miracle of technology, Rabbi Saperstein is going to join us for part of our panel following this discussion. So first, let me give full due and honor to Rabbi Saperstein by introducing him, who will then, Beshem Omro, be delivered remarks by Rabbi Dan Levin. Rabbi David Saperstein is Director Emeritus of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, having served as its director and counsel for 40 years. Rabbi Saperstein served as the United States Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, carrying out his responsibilities as the country's chief diplomat on religious freedom issues in the Obama White House. From 2019 to 2020, Rabbi Saperstein served as the president of the World Union for Progressive Judaism, the international arm of the Reform Jewish movement, and today remains a senior advisor to the URJ. Uh, I'd like to at this time call up my esteemed colleague, Rabbi Dan Levin, in order to uh, deliver the remarks that Rabbi Saperstein has prepared. So for both Rabbi Saperstein and Rabbi Levin, please a round of applause. I am not Rabbi David Saperstein, but I did stay in a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> Truly, I was blessed to serve as a legislative assistant at the Religious Action Center in the summer of 1992, and uh, am truly honored to share Rabbi Saperstein's words. For those who were at my CCAR Israel speech, you know I framed my reflections on October 7th and the Israel-Gaza conflict in terms of cognitive dissonance, the holding of two opposing truths in our minds at the same time. It is even more accurate a picture now than then. Indeed, I feel it even more keenly after the last few days. So too with our topic this morning. So here we go. On the one hand, there were bitter, profound disappointments in coalitional partners who did not speak out against the utter brutality against civilians, against women, against children, against families that Israel faced on October 7th. 1,200 killed, 3,300 wounded, over 200 taken hostage whose freedom we advocate for every day. Some have continued to refuse to condemn Hamas and embrace positions that would doom the existence of a Jewish state. Indeed, some members in our coalitions actually celebrated Hamas's attack. And since then, the impact of anti-Semitism from the left and other pro-Palestinian entities has afflicted Jews in North America and across the globe. In our Jewish communities, on our streets, most particularly in our universities, and in a number of our progressive coalitions, both by what they say and by their holding a litmus test of anti-Zionism for partnership. Cumulatively, this has left a sense of vulnerability, alienation, betrayal, isolation, and in some cases, outright fear that is unprecedented in America, at least since World War II. And at the same one hand, a pro-Israel response calls for us to refuse to legitimize those who engage in anti-Semitism and those who deny Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. On the other hand, we live in a country that is unique in how many have stood with us to combat anti-Semitism. We are focusing at this conference on the distinct form of anti-Semitism from politicized, Israel-focused anti-Semitism. But let's not forget that across much of America's political, religious, racial, and ethnic spectrums, non-Jews stand up for us when anti-Semitism comes from the full range of traditional forms of anti-Semitism. In its most violent forms, such as anti-Semitic attacks, almost always come from the right. 
attacks on synagogues and other Jewish institutions, desecration of our synagogues and cemeteries, discrimination against Jews in the workplace, the efforts of neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and Christian nationalists who see no place in America for Jews, the far right who calls out that Jews will not replace us. In the face of all this, our Christian, Muslim, and interfaith neighbors, our civil rights, women's rights, and gay rights allies, our local and state authorities, our law enforcement agencies, from local police to the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security, the full range of our progressive as well as conservative allies stand with us. And our federal government, the White House, has issued a whole of government national strategy and called on businesses and NGOs for a whole of society response. Never before in all of Jewish history have we known a non-Jewish government response like that of this administration. And what other president has so proudly declared he is a Zionist? What other leader in the world would do so? We know as well that we face enormous, urgent challenges of many kinds in America on the cusp of an election that will define the next era of American history. We gather here at what feels to be a crossroads in our nation, similarly as does Israel, indeed the world writ large, voting rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, the inequities in our economic systems, the radical shift to the right of the courts with the Roberts Court, the hyperpartisanization of our Congress, the weakening of our democratic norms, and on a global level, the perilous escalation of the climate change crisis and the widespread weakening of human rights, the rule of law, and of democracy, including alarmingly in Israel. And when you lose the Supreme Court, and the federal courts as the protector of fundamental rights, what happens in the federal, state, and local legislative bodies and in their executive branches becomes even more important. Hence the vital urgency for us to think strategically and thoughtfully of our relation to our coalitions for social justice as the 2024 election heats up and the post-election political landscape with such urgent challenges looms before us. We cannot afford to be on the outside of important coalitions that can play decisive roles in the outcome of these decisions, even if groups with which we might strongly prefer not to work are members. I should note, conversely, that is equally true of coalitions in which the Religious Action Center engages with very conservative groups with whom we might prefer not to work, but who join in the fight for international human rights, for international religious freedom, and to defend Israel's right to exist as a Jewish secure democratic state. Against this cognitive dissonance, we do need to address the trauma, pain, even grief at the sense of betrayal of key partners in our multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious, broad-based coalitional endeavors for a better America who were silent on October 7th, or even defended Hamas, or those who spoke out in the days immediately following October 7th, but once Israel's response began, ceased to support Israel's right to defend itself. Four responses. First, we need to be cautious about accepting an exaggerated narrative of betrayal of coalitional friends and allies and of broader aspects of this crisis. We have often exaggerated the frequency of anti-Semitic acts generally and of those on our college campuses. Every single anti-Semitic act is to be taken seriously and responded to. Let me say that again. Every single anti-Semitic act is to be taken seriously and responded to, albeit responded to wisely. But keep in mind that even with the ADL's significant expansion this year of what acts, statements, incidents it holds to be anti-Semitic acts, to be counted, the number for 2023, while an alarming increase from the prior year, was 8,870. 
That is, at this time of Sturm und Drang, 9,000 in a nation of 330 million people and 65 million adults holding overt anti-Semitic views according to the 24% stats that Jonathan gave us yesterday. The majority of 3,000 or so campuses have not known anti-Semitic acts or anti-Israel protests. And we at the Religious Action Center nationally have run into this tension in our existing coalitions, but relatively rarely. So too with the reports we hear at the RAC state operations, many of whom, like us nationally, are involved in environmental reproductive rights, voting rights coalitions. In the main, we have not run into this, but there are certainly are cases where we do. And in some, it has taken some intense negotiations among longtime allies to decide how to navigate holding the coalitions together. So let me reassure you, Ami, as your father and I discussed a number of times, he can't play that card, really? <laughs> Sorry, David. <laughs> as your father and I discussed a number of times when he was at the rack, pro-Israel lobbying was in its infancy, and he played a major role in filling that void. That had long ago changed, but the one area we continued and significantly expanded from what he did as the RAC grew and as pro-Israel sentiment in the progressive world diminished was our role in liberal left coalitions making the case for Israel and Zionism. The three of us here together with Sheila Katz of the National Council of Jewish Women and a couple of others carry much of that burden. But the RAC is in far more progressive coalitions than any other group. And Jonah and I often find ourselves required to prevent those coalitions from taking anti-Israel position. So often, we are the key voices making the case for Israel. Let me mention just a few key examples of those who spoke out condemning Hamas after October 7th. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and the National Council of Churches, the umbrella group of 36 mainline Protestant Orthodox denominations, the Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, the mainline Protestant Christian Century Magazine, the UCC, even the Church's Committee for Middle East Peace, which mobilizes most of the mainline Protestant denominations' opposition to Israeli policies, began its major statement with an unequivocal, we condemn the brutal attacks of Hamas on October 7th that caused the loss of life of nearly 1,400 Israelis and citizens of other nations, and we call for the immediate release of all civilians held hostage. And what about civil rights coalitions who condemned the Hamas massacre? The African-American head of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, which is the largest and most influential umbrella civil rights group in the nation. The NAACP and a number of its local chapters, the Urban League, Al Sharpton's National Action Network, and the King family-led Drum Major Institute all condemned the massacre. Reverend William Barber was particularly powerful. There is no moral justification, he wrote, for killing, kidnapping, and torturing innocent civilians, women, children, and tourists. The history of black people in America who suffered through brutal domestic terrorism and legal lynchings in the era of Jim Crow has something to say in this moment. We, especially, must say an emphatic no to what Hamas, not the Palestinian people, has done. And who could match what Van Jones' story we heard yesterday? Yes, many of these were subsequently sharply critical of Israel's policy, but have continued calling for the release of hostages. When the Federation system held 120 solidarity events the second week after the massacre, they were widely attended by religious and coalitional leaders from a wide range of the communities in which they were held. Second, of those silent, many more might have if we had only asked. As Jonathan Greenblatt argued yesterday, we cannot be passive. 
we need to assertively reach out to coalitional partners, urging existing partners to stand up for us and developing new partners. Sometimes we assume that it is self-evident why we would expect coalitional partners to speak out. Our colleague Arne Gluck offers a vivid example. Maka Wurtz and I were deeply wounded by our colleague's silence after October 7th at the statewide New Jersey Coalition of Religious Leaders. We considered resigning from the leadership team, but decided instead to confront the issue. Our colleagues listened attentively and sensitively and expressed regret and remorse for failing to understand our needs from them. The conversation was heartwarming and affirming. We agreed that we also needed to discuss the Israel-Palestine issue, which led to a three-hour in-person moderated discussion. By the time we concluded, we were able to agree that though we continued to disagree about significant things about the crisis, we could reaffirm that we share deep commitments and values that we want to continue to advance together through our common agenda. And eight months later, it is held. Third point, we'll have to leave for the discussion the strategies and tactics to avoid and address conflict in our coalitions. And finally, as to those who failed us, some in our own community say they will no longer work in coalitions with those who have not supported Israel or have not condemned Hamas or who are not explicitly anti-Zionist or who are, excuse me, explicitly anti-Zionist or at least not with those who excused, defended or celebrated Hamas's attack on Israel. I urge you to reflect carefully on that fully understandable reaction. Consider the consequences of this as a public posture. You will have handed our opponents a blueprint as to how to drive the American Jewish community out of public life. Just keep joining coalitions on any subject and the Jews will quit or engender resentment through lengthy divisive battles trying to bar such groups from coalitions having nothing to do with the Middle East. So take a real life example. CARE joined a large, effective, multi-issue interfaith coalition that does not deal with Middle East issues, abortion and reproductive rights issues, and some gay rights issues. They agreed to those terms and have not once attempted in their two years sought to change the policy of the coalition. Should pro-Israel groups leave? And if we quit, if we are not at the table of these coalitions, those anti-Israel entities will almost certainly try to drive those coalitions to line up against Israel, which would not have happened if we were there to mobilize against such efforts. As the long track record of the Religious Action Center and many of you in your own community work affirm, and to return to my opening theme, equally alarming, we will end up voluntarily leaving some of the nation's and our community's most important and effective coalitions at this crucial, defining moment in the fight to preserve American democracy and the liberal order Ami Rabbi Wolpe and Jonathan Greenblatt discussed that provided what Franklin Foer called the golden age of American Jewry in his remarkable Atlantic Magazine article. That liberal order that has given American Jews more rights, more freedoms, more opportunities than we have ever known in diaspora life. If ever there were a time to fight with all resources at hand to protect that liberal order, it is now. So this coalitional social justice work is needed more today than ever before if we are to keep American democracy strong and keep our role in this nation strong. For America's sake, for the sake of equal rights for all, for American Jewry's sake, and for Israel's sake, on that, my friends, I hope we all can agree. Thank you, Rabbi Saperstein. Thank you, Rabbi Levin. 
I'm going to frame the panel discussion. We're about to begin with brief opening remarks and then call upon our two in-person panelists and our one virtual panelist to continue the conversation and thank Rabbi Saperstein so much for his framing. The other day, the following message showed up on my social media feed. The white font laid over the background of a black Star of David featured a message playing upon the famous words of Pastor Martin Niemöller. First, they came for the LGBTQ, and I stood up, because love is love. Then they came for the immigrants, and I stood up, because families belong together. Then they came for the black community, and I stood up, because black lives matter. Then they came for me, but I stood alone, because I am a Jew. As a congregational rabbi, I have to admit that the message really hit home. Many of us feel as though despite repeated efforts to demonstrate support for marginalized groups throughout our country, throughout our world, after October the 7th, reciprocation is still forthcoming. Instead, individuals from many of those communities we have most sought to lift up may often be found leading the charge to demonize Israel and those who support it. Or perhaps that is portraying the situation as overly dire. As Rabbi Wolpe taught us yesterday, when we refrain from engaging with one another, then every side begins to think that the other side's views are more extreme than they actually are. And beneath the clickbait and the catchphrases, there are abundant examples to be found of, co of coalitions being built and common ground being found. Again, as Rabbi Wolpe cautioned us, we are often better at identifying our enemies than we are at making our friends. I see this tendency clearly in my own congregation and larger community. I suspect that many of you see it as well in yours. Like any good Reformed Jew, I have learned and preached again and again that a commandment to care for the stranger, for we were once strangers in the land of Egypt, stands paramount in the Torah. Many of us have quoted Rabbi Eliezer in Tractate Baba Metzia, saying the Torah warns us 36 times, and perhaps some say 46 times, not to oppress the stranger. And yet it is so very hard to care for others in their moments of vulnerability if we feel that we are left to stand alone in ours. My teacher, Rabbi Shai Held, teaches that one could read the story of Exodus and say, since no one came to help me in my time of need, I am under no obligation to care for others when their time arrives. Let them take care of themselves. That is, we can read Exodus towards absolving ourselves of any responsibility to care for others beyond the Jewish community. But the Torah, Rabbi Shai Held teaches, instructs just the opposite. Because you know how it feels to be shunned, abandoned, left alone to suffer, you know all too well the toil of the stranger, and so you must do better than what is done to you. The message is inspiring, but the execution can be exhausting and maddening. In his opening keynote address yesterday, Rabbi Hirsch prompted us to consider, what ought we do when a movement we support seems to turn against Israel? Should we leave? Try to find others? Have we asked our partners what business do progressives have supporting those who oppress gays or women or Christians? Building and maintaining partnerships and working alliances is so deeply challenging in this environment. As a congregational rabbi, my congregants reach out with searing examples. Rabbi, did you see that Israeli flags were banned from the Dyke March in Chicago? I did. But does that implicate all LGBTQ supporters? Rabbi, the Black Lives Matter national movement singles out Zionism as an unparalleled evil. That's true. But the pastor of our neighboring African American church reached out to me and my colleagues immediately on October the 7th, asked how he and his community could help. And when we met, 
recently on Yom HaZikaron to dedicate the Westchester Memorial to October the 7th and hear Shani Luke's father, Nisim, speak with such elegance, the pastors of the largest African-American churches in Westchester stood by my colleagues and I, embracing us in our time of mourning. But Rabbi, I saw that the Protestant movements are urging divestment from Israel. That's true. And yet my interfaith co-chair, Reverend Martha Jacobs, is the best ally a rabbi could ask for. How do we discern between the headlines and the work that gets done on the ground, between organizations in the spotlight and the many others whose stories are seldom told? And even if we are fortunate enough to connect with supportive allies, how do we balance the needs of our own community with more universalistic efforts of tikkun olam, as Rabbi Hirsch challenged us yesterday. In this time of rising anti-Semitism, ought we focus our time and resources on caring for our own? In Mishnah Gitin, it teaches, our one sustains poor Gentiles along with poor Jews, and one visits sick Gentiles along with sick Jews. One buries dead Gentiles along with dead Jews. All this is done on account of the ways of peace to foster positive relations between Jews and non-Jews. Rashi, quoting Mechilta to Rabbi Yishmael, comments, if an Israelite and a Gentile stand before you in need, you ought to prior prioritize the Israelite. If a member of your family, a citizen of your city, stand before you, you ought to prioritize your family. And if the poor of your city and the poor of another city stand before you, you ought to prioritize the poor of your own city. Here our text tradition offers us consensus. We have the right, we have the ability to prioritize the needs of our own community. However, this does not mean we can ignore the needs of our neighbors. We first take care of our own, but this does not absolve us of the responsibility to care for others. After all, as Hillel taught, and as we can all quote, If I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I am only for myself, who am I? And if not now, when? Like many of you, these are questions I ask myself a version of each day. In this moment of rampant partisanship, in which interfaith and intercommunal partners can be so hard to find, and sometimes it can feel as though no one might be there for me, ought we turn inward and care only for our own? But by isolating ourselves, who do we become? And if we don't put in the work now, when things seem most dire, when will we? Fortunately, we have gathered three of the best phone, a friend, options any rabbi or any of us could call upon. There may be no individuals as well suited and experienced to answer these questions who are doing the real work on the ground than those I am shared to honor the Bimu with today. And so I'll take a moment now to introduce my co-panelists. We've already, of course, been introduced to Rabbi Saperstein. Amanda Berman is the founder and executive director of Zionists, where she works to empower and activate Zionists on the progressive left to stand proudly in social justice spaces as Jews and Zionists. She is also a civil rights attorney who previously worked to fight anti-Semitism legally, spearheading such groundbreaking initiatives as the International Action Against Kuwait Airways for its discrimination against Israeli nationals, and the dual cases against San Francisco State University for its constitutional and civil rights violations against Jewish and Israeli students and community members. I would just add that as one of the many rabbis who has been fortunate enough to welcome Amanda into our congregation to educate our congregants, I am so honored to share the days with her today. And Amy Spitalnik is the CEO of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, the national convener of Jewish coalitions working across communities to build a just and inclusive American democracy. She previously served as executive director of Integrity First for America, which won its groundbreaking lawsuit against the neo-Nazis, white supremacists, 
and hate groups responsible for the Charlottesville violence. Under Amy's leadership, IFA became a powerful national voice in the fight against white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and extremism, and the Charlottesville case has emerged as a model for accountability. There's more that I could add for each of them, but I want to give all the time in the world for the, to hear the two of them speak. Please join in applause and welcoming these two wonderful members of our community today. First question, Rabbi Saperstein, good morning. How are you feeling? Can he hear us okay? He looks okay. <laughs> we'll come back in a moment. Um, so for the two and for the three of you, maybe we could just start a little bit in speaking a little bit of, about the work that you do and how that work has changed, been influenced by the events of October the 7th. Uh, well, first, thank you so much for having me, and it's always a pleasure to get to be with both Amanda and David and you, Rabbi. Um, I started my job full-time September 5th, so I had exactly a month in this role at JCPA before all of our world shattered in the way that we now know. Um, and for me, that both was a crisis that I don't think you know I anticipated or anyone anticipated, but it also really reinforced the vision for JCPA and the need for something like JCPA, which was founded 80 years ago during the dark days of the Holocaust as a means of mobilizing the Jewish community and our allies and partners here in the United States around democracy, around inclusivity and pluralism, recognizing that that was existential to Jewish safety. And 80 years later, particularly in this moment, particularly regarding what we're here to discuss, that mission has never been more urgent. And in some ways, I want, I want to reframe a little bit about, a little of how we're thinking about this. The Rabbi artic, uh, articulated all the ways in which we are commanded to show up for others as Jews, the moral and ethical obligations that we have, which are 100% true. But I also think it's actually existential for us as Jews to fight for the inclusive pluralistic societies that we need, not just because we know anti-Semitism is used to fuel and animate broader extremism and hate in all different directions as we've seen, but also because as anti-democratic extremism and hate against any community rises, as we see our democratic norms and values and the rule of law chipped away at, as we have in so many cases, it creates the conditions for anti-Semitism to further flourish, and it makes us as Jews fundamentally less safe. And so not only is it the right thing to do for us to show up for others, but we're actually obligated to for our own safety. And so that is exactly the work that we've been building at JCPA over the last eight plus months that I've been in this role, um, relaunching an 80-year-old legacy organization, which would have been a task unto itself, never mind the dynamics of the moment. Um, and in particular, just a few weeks ago, really with this challenge in mind, with the very real recognition of how painful and gutting this moment has been in terms of a number of the coalition spaces we've been in, in terms of the need to make the case for why Jewish safety is so inherent to other community safety in our democracy and vice versa, we've built uh, what we're calling action networks to mobilize not just Jewish communities, the local Jewish community relations councils around the country, the, uh, 125 across the country that we work with, local synagogues and other local Jewish communities, along with our national partners and allies, Jewish and non, to mobilize for democracy and to counter hate and extremism in all its forms with a fundamental understanding that the fight against anti-Semitism needs to be at the core of the fight against all hate and anti-democratic extremism. And so we've launched these action networks this month, uh, mobilizing around critical policies like the Countering Anti-Semitism Act in Congress, where we had 61 uh, Jewish organizations from across the political spectrum, from J Street to ZOA and APAC, sign a letter last week in support of this bill. Um, we have also been mobilizing the Jewish community to speak out against 
hate against other communities, like the 150 Jewish organizations that came together in a statement condemning Islamophobia and anti-Arab hate after a six-year-old Muslim child was murdered in Chicago in the fall. All of these things are at the core of the work we do because all of these things we believe are existential to Jewish safety and to our Jewish values. And so I'm really grateful to be in this role, even if it's not the world I anticipated uh, leading this organization in. Uh, so good morning, everyone, and thank you. So thank you all so much for having me. As Amy said, it's really a privilege to get to sit together and with Jonathan. Um, it's an amazing question for me to reflect on from this BIMA, because as Ami knows and the amazing staff at Stephen Wise knows, the first major event that Zionist did when I founded it in when I started running it full time in January 2019 was here on this stage. We had nine panelists in this BIMA. We had nine panelists, way too many panelists, but it was the eve of the Women's March. And it was a diverse group of leaders, including at the time city council member Richie Torres, uh, the founder of the New York Women's March, Catherine Simianco, a very diverse group of, of progressive leaders who came together to say, Jews have to be welcome in the feminist movement or the feminist movement will fail. We need to make sure that there are true intersectional coalitions that truly fight for the values and the goals of the progressive movement, or we will never advance the goals that we say we care about as progressives. If the women's movement doesn't include Jews, and of course that includes Zionists, because more than 90% of Jews are Zionists, if the women's movement kicks out Jews, it will fail, because A, it's not being consistent in its real progressive values if it is excluding any minority community, B, it's never going to win if it kicks out any committed activists of any stripe who care about the issues that the women's movement is supposed to advance. C, you can't actually kick out the people who founded the movement. You can't actually kick out the people who have been at the forefront at the inception of every social justice movement and coalition in the history of this country. You won't win. And so, you know, reflecting on what may have changed after October 7th and thinking about that first event here in January 2019, not only has nothing changed, the problem has gotten worse and the mission of Zion Us has gotten even more urgent. And so, you know, what, for those who don't know, we are a national grassroots activist organization with chapters in 44 cities and um, a variety of different, different constituency groups. We have a clergy council, as you know. We have uh, a fellowship called the Zahav Fellowship for Black Jewish Zionists, which brings together Black Jewish Zionist leaders from across the country to talk about the intersection of racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Blackness, and white supremacy in America, and advocates for Zionism as a liberation movement. Helps make sure that our community is living up to our values of diversity and inclusion internally, so that we have better representation and, frankly, better messengers externally. Uh, we also just launched a Pride Fellowship to make sure that LGBTQ Jews who are afraid to participate in Pride events this year have a Zionist space to do that. Um, our work is about making sure that, you know, as I mentioned in terms of the panel for that Women's March event, that there is a space for Jews and Zionists to participate in these movements because as Rabbi Levin read for Rabbi Saperstein, we don't have the, the luxury, frankly, of seating these spaces. Even those of us who may feel so frustrated and so pained and so lonely and so isolated from the activist spaces that you know we were always part of, that we led in, that we would have never considered seating, we can't. And it's not because we're allies, though I'm very proud of our communal legacy of allyship. It's not because we're allies, it's because we are members of affected communities, as Amy said. I can't seed the women's movement. I don't have the luxury of saying, you know what, I'm tired of the anti-Semitism, so I'm not going to advocate for reproductive freedom in America. I need it. For LGBTQ Jews, they're not being allies when they show up in the fight for LGBTQ rights in America, for marriage equality. They don't have the luxury of leaving that space. For Jews of color, they can't say, you know what, I'm not really going to fight for racial justice and equity because in a lot of those spaces, I'm experiencing so much anti-Semitism. So the response is not to leave. The response is not to say, you know, our community is pulling out. We're not going to participate in the left anymore. Because as a lot of people have articulated, it sounds like Ami yesterday and, and Rabbi Saperstein this morning and Amy and Jonathan, everybody has said, we're not going to leave. But how do we show up better? How do we show up more confidently? And for Zion S, the answer is we show up as unabashedly progressive and unapologetically Zionist. 
and we make very clear what Zionism is. Thank you. Thank you. We make very clear what Zionism is, which is a liberation movement, a progressive movement to ensure freedom and self-determination for one of the world's most enduring persecuted minority communities. You do not get to call yourself a progressive if you oppose the liberation of the world's most enduring persecuted minority community. You're not a progressive. So instead of saying, as so many of us have been saying since October 7th, I mean, I get this call every day, Amanda, I love Zion S, I love everything you stand for, but I can't call myself a progressive anymore. So I can't wear your t-shirt or your sweatshirt because it says unabashedly progressive on the sleeve. You know, I, I, I'll just tell a quick story and then, and then wrap up this, this question. In December, I got a New York Times alert that Senator John Fetterman from Pennsylvania, who I'm a big fan of, yes, snaps for, for Senator Fetterman, Senator Fetterman no longer is calling himself a progressive, and the New York Times sees fit to send me a, an alert on my phone that Senator Fetterman is no longer calling himself a progressive. And I literally yelled out loud, I remember where I was, I was actually at Kfar in Williamsburg, where <laughs> and I was with friends and I said, no, that's not the right, that's not the right strategy. It's not that John Fetterman is not a progressive, John Fetterman is a progressive. It's that the people who are celebrating October 7th are not progressives. If you are championing rape and murder and torture and kidnapping, you are not a progressive. I hate to break it to you. Actually, I don't. You are not a progressive. We are the progressives. We are the people who are fighting to advance social, racial, economic, gender, and environmental justice in America. And we are Zionists because we are consistent in our progressive values. And by the way, we also care about Palestinian self-determination as progressives. And those things are not mutually exclusive. So it's not that hard. We just need clarity in how we talk about it, confidence in how we show up with it, and make sure that, it's not that we're gonna leave coalitions, it's not that people should feel that they should ever kick us out. They can't, they won't. But we will never abandon ourselves in our activism. So Amanda, Amy are available for synagogue bookings following the panel discussion. Hi, everyone. Um, so first, my regrets, I can't, <clears throat> I can't be with you uh, this morning. And I wasn't feeling great the last couple of days. So uh, even though I tested negative over and over again, um, I remained masked um, when I was inside and off to the side. But I did see some of you outside where I was a little less um, attentive. And I truly hope not one single one of you uh, comes down with anything as a result of my interactions. Um, and secondly, I want to thank Dan uh, for having delivered the talk. I'm sure he did a better job than I would have done. Um, I'm proud of every one of our former Rise and Draft legislative assistants, um, but none more than Dan, who's been one of the leading congregational rabbis uh, these days. Um, Dan and Ami and I are, are good friends. We don't always agree on everything, but I always learn from them. If you ask me why I'm optimistic, at this time, why I'm hopeful. It's because of my two colleagues you just have been listening to. Um, they are just a paradigm of what is absolutely needed at this moment of facing the enormity. I tried to say, let's keep some perspective about the sky falling. America is certainly still different than other countries and unique um, uh, here, but the crisis is very real. And we have to be willing to thoughtfully, strategically, and tactically um, uh, engage it. And the two of them are just a great example of that. Um, uh, Amy came with enormous credibility in progressive uh, circles. Um, she uh, took an organization that was changing its entire mandate and in a very short period of time, it has become an enormous generator of very positive um, uh, engagement of exactly the kind that Amanda and uh, and Amy have been uh, have been talking about, um, and given a lot of energy to that with a reach all across um, uh, the country into the Jewish community um, here. And Amanda saw a void and jumped in with a vision and a creativity to really create something remarkable, which is exactly what we needed um, at this point. 
if we're going to kind of win these battles over the coalitional efforts we're dealing with, first, it really requires deep relationships with those organizations. It's very hard to be successful if you're on the outside of those coalitions. And then when you see something go off, you jump in at that particular time. And the best time to deal with problems is long before they arise. If there's a pride parade, the time to deal with it is with our friends and allies within the broad coalition six months in advance, just to say, look at some of the things that have arisen elsewhere. Um, will you guys take the lead in making sure it doesn't happen? Uh, here this year in our pride parade here. And that is evaluated of the reform movement and our rabbis and our congregations all across the country. As much as any entity, you are the face of American Jewry in terms of liberal progressive um, uh, coalitions. You have the long relationships. You have the trust of some of these other groups. And being able to use that wisely and effectively, um, the kind of story that I was talking about, Arnie Gluck and um, Matt being a perfect example of uh, that kind of thing, um, we can play an absolutely pivotal role in the long-term strategy of how we maintain coalitions and prevent them from being captured um, by those who want to divide Jews from the rest of the broad uh, coalition of decency and justice in this country and those who want to manipulate those coalitions into anti-Israel um, posture. So when I look at this gathering, I that's my source of hope. When I listen to Amanda and Amy, um, who are two stars of this effort, uh, that's my source of hope. Thank you, Rabbi Saperstein. And again, it's great to see you feeling well enough to speak. Thank you for joining us. You know, a lot of us here are searching for moments of hope out there, and I'm wondering that, I know that you've done a lot of the hard work and planting of the seeds in order to hopefully lead towards coalition maintenance or flourishing, even in tough times such as these. I'm wondering if either of you have any stories or thoughts that you could share with us about work that you've done in your communities that have enabled or perhaps allowed you to uh, move positively um, in this very tough time. Okay. It's... It's really hard to find the moments of hope right now because we're all still in trauma. And I think we need to recognize that we're still in trauma because there's still hostages. We're still in trauma because the war is ongoing. And we're still in trauma as American Jews because we're seeing and living firsthand the ripple effects of October 7th and the wave of hate that we've been talking about here. So all of those things are true and we need to start from that understanding and the ways in which trauma and the intergenerational trauma we all carry as Jews make it harder for us to sometimes find the hope. But I think for our own sanity and our own security in this country, we need to find those opportunities, find those moments of hope, and as we've been talking about, stay at the table wherever possible to keep building them and making them possible. And so for me, for as many moments of pain and horror and disappointment that I've had since October 7th, there have been a number of other cases in which I really have been grateful for the coalitions we've been in, the relationships we've been in. And I would say as much as the negative and the positive uh, moments have existed, so too have the fires that have not happened been important to know. It's really hard to quantify all of the problems and the moments of disappointment that didn't happen because of pre-existing relationships and partnerships. Um, some of my colleagues who lead Jewish community relations councils around the country talk about for however, you know, one or two crises that they're dealing with in their communities, there's seven or eight that didn't happen simply because of the long-standing relationships that they've been in with their interfaith partners, their cross-community partners. And so we need to recognize that. In particular for me, I know David alluded to some of this during his remarks, um, there have been really some fantastic moments of allyship with people I've worked with, people I've known for years, and people who are newer partners. And part of that is also level setting about what allyship is. It's not putting up an Israeli flag on your church or on your front door or on your social media profile. It's helping our partners and our allies understand what we need from them as Jews right now. We need them to acknowledge the pain and the grief of October 7th. We need them to call for the hostages to really be released. And perhaps most importantly, we need them to be willing to stand up against anti-Semitism here in the United States, including when it manifests as calls to ban and boycott Zionists from progressive spaces. And so by engaging with our partners and allies and understanding that, 
we can hopefully help bring them along in showing up for us in that way and helping them understand what allyship truly means. And those are some of the first calls and statements and op-eds that we saw both in the aftermath of October 7th and then now as we're seeing the campus protests and other ongoing ripple effects of the conflict um, manifest, helping our partners and allies show up in a way that actually recognizes that pain and the grief and their obligation to call out anti-Semitism in all its forms here. Um, in particular for me, I've been part of sort of a series of programs with two of my friends, Eric Ward, who some of you might know, who wrote a fantastic essay, Skin in the Game, in 2017, about how anti-Semitism fuels and animates uh, white nationalism. He's been one of my closest friends and thought partners in my work in Charlottesville and now at JCPA. And our friend, Waja Hadali, who's a Muslim American writer who wrote a book called Go Back Where You Came From. Um, we don't agree on everything, and we certainly don't agree on everything as it relates to Israel and Gaza. But the three of us have been doing sort of a mini roadshow in schools, K through 12 schools, uh, labor unions, civil rights spaces, the American Federation of Teachers. Um, Waj and I went out to LA and spoke to a room of like hundreds of TV and film writers a few weeks ago, uh, demonstrating how we can actually stay at the table with one another and have constructive conversations across lines of difference in a moment in which everyone is telling us that's not possible because we need to fight like crazy to keep our anti-hate pro-democracy coalitions in place and see each other as human beings at a moment when the loudest voices are trying to tear our communities apart. And we're not gonna agree on everything. We're not gonna agree on necessarily most things as it relates to what's happening in Gaza right now. But we can fundamentally see each other as human beings. We can all acknowledge that what happened on October 7th is horrifying, the hostages need to be released, Palestinian civilians deserve safety and self-determination. And most importantly, those of us here at home who are grappling with the anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, anti-Arab ripple effects of the conflict deserve safety as well. And so by being able to stay at the table together and have these constructive conversations across these lines of difference, we've been trying to not only sort of remind ourselves that that's possible as we're doing this national coalition work, but also really demonstrate for others, including students and teachers and other, those who are on the front lines of these conversations, that it's not only possible, but, but necessary. And so that's where I found some of my hope in the last few months. So, you know, they say like the, the, the darkest light, the, what's the, the, the darkest before the dawn, yeah. Um, watching the reaction from the Jewish community, no, that's not, those aren't the right words. Seeing the way that we have mobilized together, reconnected to each other, um, committed to our Jewishness, shown up. I was at Westchester Reform, some of you may have been there on I think October 10th. I mean, I don't know if that synagogue has ever had so many people in it, and WRT is a big place. And you know, I know that for so many of you, I was with you shortly after, and you know, Synagogues, and you know this better than I do, have been filled. People have been showing up and connecting, reconnecting, many of them, or connecting for the first time to Jewish life because of that, the activation of that trauma that Amy mentioned. And it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. Do we want people to be activated because of the negative, because of their fear, because of the vulnerability they feel? Of course not, that's not the ideal. The ideal is that every generation of Jews is connected, is committed, understands our values, and you know our mandate to be a light unto the nation, to pursue tikkun olam, um, and also, by the way, to pursue our particularism, which includes our Zionism, our, our particular needs of the Jewish future, including the safety of the Jewish people in our sovereign homeland. So. There's something that has happened, and by the way, I saw this happen also in May 2021, the number of people who showed up and started caring about being Jewish, even people in my personal life who knew what I did professionally and were like tangentially interested, but not really that interested, all of a sudden in May 2021, during the last Gaza conflict, showed up and, you know, again, because of the vulnerability, really, you know, signed up in droves to become part of Zionist chapters, to come to trainings, to learn how to engage and to talk about these issues, to figure out a place where they could show up for their progressive values without abandoning their Zionism and their Jewish commitments. But by like August, July, August of 2021, 
people were over it because that moment of vulnerability, at least like the really extreme vulnerability had passed. And so for a lot of people, it was back to normal, whatever normal was. And so I don't know if you experienced that in synagogues also that, you know, in May and June people were showing up and by July and August they were over it back then. I have not seen that happen. And perhaps it is because, as Amy mentioned, we are still in active trauma. But the amount of people that I have seen care, deeply care, I mean, really, like over the last eight months, who really want to learn about a lifetime of Jewishness, Judaism and Jewishness, which I see as sort of different. People who want to, you know, send their, their young kids to Jewish schools, people who want to make sure that their kids are getting bar and bat mitzvahed. Um, you know, people who celebrated Passover. I know a lot of Jews celebrate Passover, but I have people in my life who didn't care so much, but this year it was like, of course, we have to, we have to celebrate Passover. So, again, it feels sort of cynical to say that that's hopeful for me because it's coming from such a negative place, but it's an opportunity because the Jewish people, sometimes we need a reminder of our vulnerability. And this, by the way, is something I talk about a lot with young people who maybe are teetering on the brink of anti-Zionism and you know, wanna hear why I think that's not where they should go. I remind them that we happen to be living right now in this tiny blip of Jewish history, this 75, 76 year blip of Jewish history, where they are safe in the world because of Israel and they don't even know it because they never lived in a world without Israel. And obviously that's true for me too. I mean, it's true for most of us here, right? That we never lived in a world without Israel. But growing up today in America where, you, where there is a strong American Jewish community relative both to you know, Jews throughout history and relative to other minority communities, the Jewish community is absolutely strong and we are represented by you know, so many Jewish communal institutions at every level, local, state, federal, you know, that do religious freedom, security, Israel, kosher, right? Like at every level, we are represented by Jewish institutions. And so, so many Jews have grown up in a world where they never had to care that much about being Jewish because all of their Jewish needs were being handled by someone else. And that's an unbelievable thing that our institutions and our rabbis have been able to create a world for American Jews where they didn't have to think that much about it. And now they're realizing that they don't have the luxury of that. Any more than we have the luxury of seeding movements that affect our bodies and our rights and our ability to marry who we want and the world that we live in, the planet, you know, whether we're gonna get shot in an elementary school, all of these things, we don't have the luxury of seeding those movements, but we also don't have the luxury of seeding our Jewishness. You can't run away from your Jewishness. You can try to pass a litmus test, you can try to prove yourself to someone, but you're never going to prove yourself to anyone because at the end of the day, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. And so people realizing that and really wanting to come to a space that feels like home, whatever it is, whether it's a political space or a, a synagogue space, you know, an activist space, whatever it is, people are looking for their Jewish home and they're finding it because our leaders, our rabbis, all of you are working so hard to make sure that we're responsive to the, to the needs of the community. And that gives me so much hope because it's working, because I see for how many people it's working. I'll tell a really quick story without naming, just because it's a big room, but I mentioned our Zahav, the Zahav Fellowship for Black Jewish Zionists, which is probably the most fascinating and most meaningful thing that I've ever worked on. We had a summit for all of these leaders in New York City in the beginning of February. And we brought a lot of different people to meet with them. And one of the people who came is someone, again, I. I'm sorry, it's weird to not say the name, but it's someone whose name you would recognize who has said a lot of really dangerous, really damaging things about Jews and Zionism in the past, a black non-Jewish leader. And it was someone who woke up on October 7th, an international leader, I should say, I woke up on October 7th, saw the images, and looked around in her spaces and said to people that she'd been in racial justice organizing with, we condemn this, right? Like, this is the most horrible thing I've ever seen. And people in her spaces were like, no, 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 this is decolonization. This is what we wanted, this is great. She's like, no, no, I'm not down for this. This is not what I wanted. This is not what I was advocating for. And people said, resistance by any means necessary. Israel is a white supremacist colonial genocidal state. This is how we undo it. And she's like, no, when I said, you know, undo the Zionist colonial entity, this isn't actually what I meant. She didn't really know what she meant when she said that, right? Like so many people who say that, they don't actually think that much about what it means in practice. 
And so she was so shocked and mind blown by the reaction from the partners and, and colleagues that she had been working with for such a long time in racial justice organizing that she started to rethink some of her own statements, recorded statements, things that are out there that people know, right? That she's been held accountable for and frankly didn't care that much about for a long time. And so someone connected us and I got together with her and we had dinner near here in December and she said to me, Amanda, I need you to tell me what Zionism is. This is a person who had said we need to undo the Zionist colonial entity multiple times. Zionism is genocide, oppression, you know, apartheid. She had a, a, a very committed position on Zionism and years later is sitting across from me saying, I need you to tell me what it is. So I could have done what I think a lot of Jews have done, you know, in these kind of opportunities, these moments is say, it's too late for you to ask that question. I'm not gonna engage, you're an anti-Semite, and I'm not gonna participate in this. But it was a huge opportunity. And this is a thing that we need to remember. People don't understand what they're advocating for. And even some of the people that are engaging in the most outright anti-Semitic things genuinely don't understand it because anti-Semitism is complicated. It's not as straightforward as other forms of hate. So I told this person, how I think about Zionism and what it means to Zioness and how we define it for our movement. And I said, you know what, I wanna show you a video. And I pulled up a 90 second clip on our Instagram of our Zaha fellows, a little clip where everyone had sent in a 30 second video or something saying, I shout my Zionism because fill in the blank. And we pulled it, pulled it together into a reel on Instagram. And I played it for her and she started crying. And she was like, I don't know why I'm so emotional. And I said, because you are literally seeing with your eyes that everything you thought you knew is wrong. You thought Jews are white, colonizers, white supremacists have no relationship to the Middle East. You thought that we're all the same. We all have the same financial resources. Like you believed all of these tropes and now you're seeing literally that this is not what you thought it was. That, that Jews are not who you thought we are. That Zionism is not what you thought it was. And she said, I wanna meet these people. Like I need to learn from them. So she came, when we had the Zahav Summit in February, she flew here from far away and walked into a room of 16 black Jewish Zionists who were not soft on her. And it was really emotional. And for, for probably seven minutes, I thought I had blown up my whole career because I thought nothing good was gonna come of it because it was too intense and you know she wasn't expecting, I think she was expecting a little bit more respect and it wasn't that they were disrespectful, but they were not soft. They said, you endangered me in my black spaces, you endangered my Jewish community, you, you know, you divided the racial justice movement. I mean, it was, it was heavy. But it led to a transformation moment because she, she couldn't, I mean, she broke down. And then when she showed her vulnerability in, and in that moment and her regret, everyone else broke down. And so it led to this real learning, like this real conversation, both about what Zionism is, what it means to the Jewish people who do not all look the same, who do not all have the same background, who do not come from Europe. So that obviously first foundation you know, issue. But then the anti-blackness that exists in, in anti-Semitic spaces, in anti-Jewish spaces, in anti-democracy spaces. The experience that black Jews have in America when they talk about their Jewishness, you know, in other black spaces. And just the way that, you know, all of our communities need to figure out how to work together and, and how critical it is that we, you know, define our shared values and work toward them even if we don't agree on absolutely everything. And so, I mean, it was about a two hour conversation. I think it was the most intense, but also most important two hours I've ever witnessed. There are really hopeful moments that can come and really, really game changing opportunities when we engage even beyond our comfort zone, even with people who have said things that are objectively horrible, that people are waking up every day and wanting to learn because their minds are being blown by what they're learning in the world, what they see happening with their algorithms. And they're just, there are a lot of moments of hope that you may not be hearing about, and I think Amy made this point really importantly. There's so many things that don't happen, and we don't hear those things. And I've long said, you know, to people who love when Zioness goes into a space and, you know, is yelling at an anti-Semite, and you know, in some sense, right? Like responding to someone saying Zionists can't welcome here, or, you know, can't show up here, or aren't welcome here. When we respond to that, it gives, you know, a sense of I think strength to people in our community who really want to see someone fighting back. But 
I have always said, when we are successful, at the end of the day, and I believe that together, Amy and I and, and Sheila and, and Rabbi Saperstein and everyone at The Rack and all of you, when we are successful, we're not gonna have stories to tell because we're not gonna be shut out of the spaces that matter in the first place. And so when, when you're really winning, you don't always know that you're winning because you don't have anything to measure it by. It's just that the problem is no longer happening. And, I, and obviously that's not where we are right now. But there's a lot of good that's happening that, you know, that we don't always know about because we don't, we don't know the negative, you know? Well, and I just want to underscore sort of the, the story that you told so beautifully about the Sahab Fellowship and, and this person. It has been replicated in so many of my own experiences. I've been, for example, doing workshops with the American Federation of Teachers, the National Teachers Union, and including at their higher ed conference in LA the other month. And I, I was a little afraid walking into something, you know, there was this like, in some of these spaces, there were people who were, you know, coming into my workshops wearing kafias. I was there to give a workshop on anti-Semitism. And at the end, you know, I, I spent time really unpacking. For example, when we say ban and boycott Zionists, what does that mean? Not all American Jews have a relationship with Israel, but the vast majority of us do. 80 to 90% of us have a deep personal connection to Israel, identify as a Zionist in the broad sense of the term. And so when you say ban and boycott 80 to 90% of American Jews, you're effectively saying ban and boycott the vast majority of American Jews. And how do we not understand that as a form of anti-Semitic discrimination? And when you actually sit down with people and unpack this, it helps them understand what some of these, you know, little like social media slogans actually mean in practice. And at the end of one of these sessions, one of these educators came up to me and said, I really think I've been flattening the term Zionist in my mind. And it seems like it's a little bit more complicated than I understood it. And if that alone was the takeaway, then that alone is reason to fly across the country and do some of these workshops. And, it, you know, and how we replicate that, how we empower people across the country to have these same conversations in those challenging spaces so that those people who are in turn teachers, educators, and leaders in their own communities can go on and engage their own communities in this is really, I think, how we get to the place where there aren't those crises or those fires anymore. So thank you, and I think we have about five minutes left or so, and so I have, I have two quick questions that are maybe 90, 90 second responses. I'm gonna ask them both, and you can decide which one or which ones you'd like to answer. So first one is Rabbi Hirsch yesterday spoke about the need to set parameters within our communities. And I'm wondering that in all of the work that you do, are there deal breakers in which you say, I simply cannot be in coalition what does that look like, and how do you respond? Number two is, um, if we are making the case for Zionism as a progressive value, we have to note the fact that the current Israeli government is possibly the least progressive Israeli government that the state has ever seen. How do you talk about Zionism in a progressive light, given the anti-progressive messaging coming out of the current government? You guys pick. I'll go quickly. I might answer both, because I actually think they're deeply related. Right? I think I, I talked earlier about how we do some level setting on what allyship actually is. And that's where the starting point is for what those red lines should be. There's been sort of a, a division happening on the, on the left. There's what I would call, and I think other people have used this term, the paraglider left, right? The people who were out there on October 7th celebrating the massacre of Jews in Israel, uh, calling it an act of creative resistance, which is what the SJP chapter at my own alma mater, Tufts, did. Um, or otherwise really like celebrating what was the deadliest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust as the greatest thing since sliced bread. That is a red line that are not only sort of beyond the pale of who we engage, but should be universally condemned and inherently, as Amanda said, not a progressive value. It is not progressive to support mass murder and the use of terrorism against innocent civilians, no matter who they are. But then there are the people who whether it's ignorance, whether it's fundamental disagreement over the actions of the Israeli government or the current Israeli government or how IDF, the IDF goes about its, its missions in Gaza, will have actual disagreements with us or might be using terms and slogans that they either don't fully understand how it's heard because we're frankly not even speaking the same language as people. I did an event a couple months ago with an Arab American partner and she hears terms like from the river to the sea very differently than I hear it as a Jewish American who whose relationship with Israel came of age during the second intifada. And phrases like intifada mean something very different to me than it might mean to her. And how we actually call people in on understanding what, how these terms are heard, 
how we recognize that some people might not be, as Amanda has, has described, approaching this from the same perspective that we are and therefore can be called into the conversation and, under, and help uh, brought along to how we actually hear a lot of these phrases and ideas is how we figure out where that line is. Who are the people we could bring into the coalitions? Who are the people who can actually, we can work with across disagreement on policy, across disagreement on governance? For me, I mean, in September I was outside the UN with a number, perhaps with some people in this room, with a number of other sort of prominent Jewish New York leaders protesting the Netanyahu government's anti-democratic rollbacks. And for me, that is just as important as showing up to stand, uh, showing up for the hostages. Both are existential to my Zionism and to my Judaism. And in telling that story to people who might not fully understand what Zionism means or what my relationship to Israel means, that actually helps them understand that complexity and nuance and unpack both for me where that red line is and who can be part of our coalitions and who we can work with and who is perhaps outside that tent. So these are great questions. I'll take the second one first because I think I can be quicker and then if I have time, I'll come back to the first one. So, Zionism being progressive is so obvious to me, and Zionism not being political is also obvious to me. So when I talk about Zionism, it is about the liberation and self-determination of the Jewish people in our ancestral homeland. Modern political Zionism is a movement, obviously founded by Theodore Herzl, to recreate a Jewish homeland at a time that nation states were being born, that the Jewish nation would have a state just like so many other nations. Now there are 193 nations, the Jewish nation is one of them. Modern political Zionism is not political in the sense of right, left, Likud, Labor, Democrat, Republican, right? It's political in the sense of sovereignty and statehood. And it is based on the word Zionism. Herzl didn't come up with it. Another European intellectual, Nathan Birnbaum, came up with it. And Birnbaum explained that using the word Zionism to define this political movement was based on the Jewish people's relationship to Zion that we are born at Mount Zion, we are the children of Zion, our peoplehood, our, our entire peoplehood is the story of, of Zionism. Our history, our faith, our culture, our traditions, our religion, all of it is about Zion. The longing to return to Zion is the one thing that united the Jewish people in the diaspora for 2,000 years. Jews who were not connected to each other, didn't know each other existed, did not have Twitter, were not like, when are we going home, right? But like prayed in the direction of Zion, you know, lit Shabbat candles and prayed to return, said Shema Yisrael, right? Like, you broke the, the glass at the wedding to commemorate the, the destruction of the Second Temple. I mean, Zion is so intrinsic and so integral to Jewish identity and Jewish faith and culture and history. It's inextricable. So when I talk about Zionism, it has nothing to do with the Netanyahu government and it has nothing to do with the American government. And I'm often reminding people, you can be a Zionist in any given moment. Put aside this government because we have such strong feelings about it, most of us. In any given moment with any Israeli government, you can be a Zionist who approves of the Israeli government, opposes the Israeli government, is ambivalent to the Israeli government, or where most American Jews are, or at least were before October 7th, you can be a Zionist that does not know anything about the Israeli government. That's not what Zionism is. So I am a Zionist who is also a progressive, who also wants to advance civil and human rights for all marginalized communities, including the Jewish people. And as a progressive, I want Israel to be a more progressive country, both internally and vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors. That's what I want. I don't use the phrase progressive Zionism. People often call Zionists a progressive Zionist organization. And it's not that I'm you know, opposed to the use of that term or that I don't like, you know, feel that it resonates for me as a human being. But when people use the phrase progressive Zionism, what I think they mean, what I hear them saying, is that they're qualifying their Zionism with some kind of political orientation. That they're, what they want for Israel is a more progressive political orientation. For me, I'm a Zionist that wants Israel to exist, and I want it to be more progressive as I want America to be more progressive. So there's, it's really important, I think, to distinguish between these things and to say Zionism is not about politics. I'm not gonna let you ascribe anything political to my belief that the Jewish people should be free and sovereign. That's not about politics. And separately, I'm a progressive and I want 
pluralism in Israel and I want democracy in Israel and I want a functioning Supreme Court and I don't want people who say insane, horrible, psychotic things and support Jewish terrorism against Palestinians. I don't want any of that in Israel or anywhere else. But that's not about my Zionism. That's really bad behavior by certain Israelis that I can condemn very easily without it having any relationship to my Zionism. And by the way, last thing I'll say is 20% of Israeli society protested their government in the name of their Zionism every week for 40 weeks before October 7th. So the idea that, you know, Zionism is not progressive. I've never seen a show of force, a pro-democracy show of force, anywhere in the history of humankind like 20% of a country showing up every single week for 40 weeks to protest their government. Like, I've never seen anything like that. If we did that here after January 6th, imagine where we would be in America. Imagine if countries all over the world had the progressive commitment that Israelis have to protecting their country and their democracy. And that is, to me, like the essence of how you can be a Zionist and a progressive. Follow Israelis. For those who heard me at the CCAR convention, if you weren't there, I urge you to, uh, to uh, read the talk. Um, I argue that there's a limited amount that we can do about the situation in Gaza right now. There will be coming down the road. But there's a lot we can do to keep the two-state solution as a viable possibility and to really put pressure on this government. I would like to see the American Jewish community lead the campaign with a lot of our allies who are, have trouble seeing common ground with us, that there has to be a freeze on settlements, there has to be an end to the hate speech and the racism of the extreme elements um, in Israel. Settle of violence has to be stopped by this government with accountability. If we're gonna keep a two-state solution option, open, we can actually do something right now that will really make a difference and can help reforge relationships with allies who feel helpless right now, um, not being able to do something uh, constructive. So if I, we're talking about confronting the government in a way that will be um, uh, beneficial to the values that we're fighting for, that would be the direction I would go. Please join me in thanking, honoring our three amazing advocates and speakers.